Hello and welcome to a very special episode of 420 Grams here on NewsClick.in. We have, for the first time since this show has become a video format, uh, Baichung Bhutia, the, the OG <laughs> uh, legend of Indian football uh, with us here today. He was, of course, the top scorer and the highest capped Indian footballer ever till Sunil Chetri took all of those things away from him. But, uh, Bai, thanks for coming in. It's good to have you in studio. Uh, we're talking, of course, about the state of Indian football and how things have developed since the 10 or so years since you've stopped playing the sport professionally. Uh, you've, of course, still been engaged with it in various different ways through United Sikkim, the Football Players Association of India, as well as in various capacities with the Football Federation. Uh, today's a big day. Yeah. The, the, the executive committee is meeting to decide on, on the way forward. So, First question, how do you see things having moved, uh, let's say, over the past five, six years since the coming in of the ISL mm. and all of this that's going on? No, I think when, uh, uh, at the current state, I'm not aware of what's happening because for the last one, two years, I've not really been connected with football. I've been completely out of it. Uh, so I don't know exactly what's happening right now though I'm now keeping a bit of track about what's happening um, but yes uh, you know I've been very fortunate enough uh, to have worked in All India Football Federation as an advisor to the Federation as a technical chairman of technical committee as a chairman uh, so I've had that experience working in Federation again towards the club side I own a football club that went to play for I League for mm -hmm. two seasons I still own a club United Sikkim uh, so, yeah, and then obviously when uh, ISL came in, I did have an opportunity to work with ISL uh, for one, two season and also work with television. So, uh, having got that experience of all the sides, so, you know, everybody's got their uh, uh, plus and minuses uh, yeah. and their points and plus neg positive and negative to the side of it. Uh, but I think uh, overall, yes, uh, during during the last five years, uh, bef before five, three, four years when I was working as Football Federation, we had a complete plan as a technical committee chairman and uh, with the Federation as an advisor. Uh, we managed to plan, you know, the entire structure of Indian football. Mm. And the, my main challenge when I was working with the Federation was to get the structure right. Obviously, it was uh, quite a difficult task, which I think still it's not yet properly, you know, uh, done at the moment. I think uh, the biggest challenge for Indian football right now is to get the structure right. And once you have it, I think then everything will follow. But we did manage to work with the national team. Uh, you know, our challenges were when I joined in as, as an advisor and technical committee chairman, we were ranked 176. So we wanted to get Indian team in top 100, which we achieved in, you know, two, three years. Mm. So uh, yeah, a lot of things technically we managed to work, uh, but there are a lot of challenges which obviously had uh, had to be done which obviously the tenure came to an end as well but uh, I'm sure I think overall we need to really look at the development of Indian football and there are various parties to making it happen and I think all the parties should actually keep a priority of keeping Indian football first and trying to take the game forward and I think that should be the priority and uh, if that can be the priority I'm sure there are a lot of challenges but uh, uh, it's not a it's not a difficult challenge or something which is not Im, you know it's impossible to solve. The, it is possible to solve, but everybody will have to give and take kind of situation and bargain on the, those points. So I mean maybe uh, getting a little more specific in terms of what some of these solutions are. I think one of the big conflicts today is that we have two leagues, of course, uh, the ISL and the I League. One was the old National League in which you played and all the big old clubs of India play in. <coughs> and the other is a closed private league. Mm. So, how do you think these two can come together and coexist in a manner that is, like you said, beneficial for the overall structure of Indian football? So, I think you need to have a long-term plan. Uh, you need to have a time period for what you want to do it. Uh, and I'm sure ISL, I-League and the Federation and all of us uh, who are involved with football would want a bigger, better league uh, and a longer league. Mm. And I think um, there are challenges, obviously, ISL um, and, and uh, football development were working with ISL. 
I think has you know has contracts with with the ISL teams. So uh, and uh, same with Federation and I League as well. So I think if you have a long term plan, have a deadline to it, and say in certain in uh, this number of years we would want to have this kind of league. You know, it's okay to have uh, one league which is the premium league with more teams. And then have a lower division league, which is there, which I think Federation is planning as right. well. Mm -hmm. And I think recent statement of Mr. Praful Patel in next two, three years, we will be able to solve it is, is a welcome um, statement because I think that's where, uh, you know, if you have a long term, say two, three years, we're going to do this, then everybody's preparing from now on to see that, uh, you know, the structure in that way. Yeah. Um, so at the end, I think you need, you need a longer league. You need more teams in uh, in the Premier League, whether it be it ISL, I League, or any name, anything. Yeah. I think it's just the name. Yeah. Uh, and then you need to have relegation and promotion in every league because uh, for every club to come in today, I think you know the, all the clubs that are uh, are running in ISL, I League, uh, are having challenges in terms of sponsorship. So I think for football to really generate revenue is um, you know it's not only through sponsorship because a lot of the clubs around the world don't really make revenue out of sponsorship. They make a lot of revenues out of producing, bringing out real talent from you know from from the grassroots level, mm -hmm. and that's how a lot of clubs survive in you uh, in England and and European clubs and in South America as well. Mm -hmm. And, and that is the format I think which we'll have to look into it because if the club starts investing and in producing their own footballers, then I think the quality of the players, the quality of the game, as well as well as business of the game is going to come up. So for that, you need to really have uh, you know uh, the structure has to be right, the leagues has to have uh, you know uh, your relegation and promotion, uh, and that's how I think more competition. Uh, uh, more challenges, I think that's how the game is going to go. Everyone stays on their toes. Uh, if you can give us an idea, in, in your opinion, for a country the size of India and with the numbers that we have of A, football clubs and B, now growing number of football fans as well. Uh, and the game is being followed also in a more pan-India way than it used to be in the past, perhaps. Uh, so, what is what do you think would be a good number of clubs to have in this top tier? Whatever, like you said, whatever we call it, that's not important for us at least. No, I think uh, for a country like India, I guess minimum twenty teams is 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 really required for a top league. Uh, even you know a small country like England has got almost nineteen twenty league in Premier League. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you need to look at the cost factor uh, also towards it because it's not easy for a game like football in India to generate that kind of sponsorship and revenue. Yeah. Uh, I think there are ways to try it out because if, if things are not working out, there's nothing wrong in trying something new. Mm -hmm. And if that does not work, try and come up with alternative plans. So, uh, you know, like in US, you've got uh, Western and Eastern conferences. You could yeah. even try and divide the entire top layer of league into four zones and have you know the league played in those areas to save your revenue and then the best of two or three clubs can come and play the entire kind of play, uh, play you know come and play again a league uh, you know for the complete uh, as a, at the national level mm -hmm. so i think there are a lot of formats that can be worked out for you know for the make, to make the competition much better mm -hmm. to make more involvement of the players but uh, i think for us the challenge is right now is to make sure that we create that culture uh, you know football culture in in rest of the country as well because uh, i think if you can create that culture where kids are waking up and just wanting to play football whether it's inside the room or whether you know or, or on a ground i think that culture has to be created and that is going to be more challenging um, so if we can have you know like today if you look at if you compare indian football uh, and South American football in terms of infrastructure, facilities, uh, culture, more weather, I think it's a bit similar. It's just that football is so big in South America, all the kids are just wanting to play yeah. because there's so much of culture, you know, and, and anywhere you go, the kids are only seeing people talk about football, are discussing football, playing. So even small area, small street side, you know, the kids are just playing. Yeah. I think we need to develop that and until and unless, uh, because you don't, uh, you don't only require, I think South America and African countries have really proved that you don't also require so much of, you know, it's not, at the end, it's not only about money that can produce players. Mm -hmm. I think today, if you look at Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Colombia, uh, 
uh, you know, smaller countries in, in South America are also, you know, are producing great players. Top level talent. Uh, not by spending what the Man United are spending in the grassroots or uh, Ajax are spending. They have still have been able to produce. So, I think that uh, kind of culture, that kind of um, environment has to be created. So, you, you've been running the Baichung Bhutia football schools now for, for a long time and uh, you've now got more than 3,000 uh, kids that are signed up, that are coming for training. How do you see the attitude, this culture? Is it coming in to focus a little bit? How are parents sort of uh, getting into the act and uh, are more kids coming out to play football? Uh, yes, uh, I think today uh, football is the most highest watched sport in India for the age of under 12 or under 14. Uh, and that's the fact, I think even the data show it. And if you look at the kids uh, today, in, uh, you know, especially uh, kids around the age of 14, most of the kids would be knowing football. Obviously, it's sad that they follow a lot of European football, world football, not much of Indian football. But still, I think they're following football and they're wanting to play. So, I think the popularity of the sport has definitely grown. And with even Baichung Bhutia football schools, we've got a lot of kids coming and playing. For us, the bigger, bigger uh, challenge when I started uh, BVFS was to make sure that uh, you know you want kids to come and play. Mm. Uh, you, it's not necessarily uh, you would want to be a professional player coming to BVFS. Obviously, we want to create professional players out of Baichung Bhutia football schools. But if not that as well, we want kids to come and play and at least stay fit and healthy. And also, I think football is one sport that can really teach kids to uh, it's a, it teaches you way of life and it really helps you in, in your day-to-day -day life when you become uh, adults. So I think that really helps with the sport. And uh, I think that is the reason why our main challenge was to make many kids come and play. And at the same time, if there are, you know, talented, good players, we show them, uh, you know, give them that platform and to guide them to their dreams of becoming professional players and which we've been doing in the last seven years of, by, uh, you know, no, 10 years of, almost 10 years of BVFS, we've started Indian Football Foundation, which is our foundation. Through that, we give a lot of scholarship to kids who are from, you know, humble background and who are highly talented, can't afford, uh, you know, to, uh, to come and join BVFS. Mm. So we've got at least 30, 40 kids through those scholarship and uh, almost eight, nine of my boys have gone on to play for India in different age group. And recently, three months ago, two of my under-16 boys, one from Meghalaya Shila and one from Orissa, went on to play under-16 in India. So, you know, that is what we want to. And uh, I think we are a little different from a lot of uh, academies here, uh, you know, especially the big names from Europe, clubs have come here, started. Mm -hmm. I think it's good that the clubs are teaching, but here for us we are different because it's just not about also coaching. If the player is talented, we can guide him to fulfill his dream of playing for India and playing for ISL and I League clubs. And that I don't think uh, any academies and uh, football schools in India, name it, uh, any big European clubs can do that. And I think that's only where BVFS, Baiching Bhutia Football School have been doing it mm. and will continue to do it and guide players to become professional players and support them and help them uh, till the time, you know, they have good contracts and good uh, people to look after them. Fair enough. So, uh, just coming to the national team, of course, now there's a very high profile coach in the form of Igor Stimach who's come in the World Cup, uh, bronze medalist with Croatia and, and also a uh, reasonably well respected coach. He's got his task cut out for him as we clearly saw saw from the game the other day but uh, one of the i think key sort of things that came out of that game and steemach himself mentioned it that the players who are in the senior national team are getting maybe 20 30 games competitive fixtures in a season and that's nowhere close to enough uh, i mean there there's some figures of how many minutes <laughs> some of the some of the boys have played and it, it's nowhere close to the kind of, I mean, so just what's your no, take on No, I think on? I'm glad he's taken it out. Imagine when we played for India, when I started my debut for India in 1995, uh, we played only five to six games the entire year and there were times we only played uh, the um, Olympic qualifiers and the World Cup qualifiers. Mm. Um, and and unluckily, if you manage to get big teams like Japan or Korea, you play two matches, the home and away, or one match, and you're out. And your entire one year just playing two matches for India is gone. Mm. So uh, now, if you look at the number of matches the international players are playing, at least they're playing 20, which obviously 
and the coach is complaining is not go, good enough. Mm. But they are playing quite a lot of matches because mm. you know within last one month I've just seen India play already six seven matches and now mm. with the intercontinental they're going to play quite a bit. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, at the end it's important yes to play more matches, uh, but. Uh, for a coach, what I was hearing and seeing his interview, he's been, uh, he's been, you know, he's been, um, obviously, no matter how good a coach he is, I think for him, if you don't give him good quality players, it'll always be difficult for him to produce produce results. And we've been hearing it through his interview that uh, he's really struggling to find defenders and strikers, which is genuinely an issue for right now for Indian football. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the reason why I think for us right now is to produce good quality uh, players that was that is a main focus and when i was advising the federation as well you know this grassroots football for the kids uh, was very very important uh, and we were trying to also make sure that through federation to also pressurize a lot of state associations and district football associations associations to work because at the end of the day no matter what policies uh, you make in federation or what all schemes or what all tournaments and things you do f for bringing up football mm -hmm. and all the players uh, are going to come from state and district so federation can't produce players Produ players are going to come from different states and district and until and un unless you don't have state associations and district associations really working then it becomes very difficult to bring in players. And again, now because I work in uh, Sikkim Football Association, I'm one of the members there, and I know what challenges against state associations. So mm. I think it's important for the federation also to guide the state associations because a lot of state associations today are lacking in that knowledge to really take uh, take the game forward in terms of organizing grassroots football, organizing your own league. And to some of the big states today, like you have states like UP, you have states like Uttarakhand, uh, Himachal, uh, does not have a proper league. Uh, you know, Rajasthan, where football is still big. You know, you know, I, th I feel um, UP has got huge, uh, huge talent. Uh, you go to Madhya Pradesh, I think they are having challenges in having their own league. So until and unless you don't have your own league for seniors, forget the grassroots. So mm -hmm. how, when, when and how you're going to bring up, you know, players, players. So that has been a challenge and I think that's where I think the federation, the state associations will have to work. And till the time we don't produce good quality players, then we'll keep having, you know, the best of coaches working for the national team and struggle to really get results because you don't have good defenders now. Mm. After Sunil retires, after a few years, you don't have a striker to replace him. Uh, so I think for us right now, the biggest challenge is to also make sure that uh, from the grassroots we're producing that quality players. Mm. And I think under-17 World Cup did bring quite a lot of buzz about the grassroots football because we were hosting under-17 World Cup. So that time, uh, the focus was so much on the grassroots uh, uh, football to promote, and you know, and was the and we did quite a lot. But once under-17 World Cup is over, we're not seeing uh, you know that grassroots football program which was there to have taken a bigger stride, which is I think uh, a bit sad. Mm. So, so uh, talking about also this expanding player base and of course things are not going perhaps at the pace that we had envisioned they might, but still growth is happening in one area in which I think we've seen a lot of growth recently is uh, in women's football. The Women's World Cup just finished and that was the most watched Women's World Cup ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of media interest also a lot more than there has been in the past. Uh, in India, the women's national team has been getting more exposure, more opportunities to play games and we can see how they are improving as well. Uh, at the grassroots level, what is your sort of take on uh, girls and women getting into the sport and in terms of what kind of structure needs to be created for women to have opportunities no, to I play as well? I think women's football in India has got huge potential and I think slowly, you know, a lot has been, you know, put... put uh, put in by the federation and also a few state associations. I think we need to encourage more girls to come and start playing football because, uh, you know, I have BVFS, Baichung Bhutia football schools and it's open for the girls as well. Mm. Uh, and what we really see and which is quite saddening is that number of girls coming in really training and playing football is quite, quite less, which I expected to do much more. Uh, so we need to really encourage a lot of parents to 
make their girls come and play football as well. But at the same time, you also need to give that space, platform, and that in, create that environment. And because I have two young daughters, and they are quite keen, but uh, I think the school and the place where, especially where they, they're studying in Sikkim, even there as well, we're challenging to, challenge, challenges are there for them to just go and play with, with other girls. They don't get many other girls to play football and school does not also push so much into girls football so there are challenges in in that way but i think women football definitely has got huge potential uh, in fact uh, i've been one of the most uh, vocal about pushing women's football again you know when i was with the federation working uh, as an advisor we may, we wanted to create women's football academy in in manipur and uh, during that time uh, scott was technical director. I, I along with Scott, flew off to Manipur, met um, for football. We flew off to Meghalaya also mm. uh, to make sure that there is space and you know create an academy for women's uh, football mm. for the age of under uh, under 16. Right. Uh, there was sincere effort which we wanted because we felt that it has huge potential. Mm. Even when I worked for a year with Vedanta uh, Sesa Football Academy in Goa as as a advisor there. The first thing I told them was to create a women's league, in which I think Vedanta has created a women's league in Goa now. In Goa it's it's one of the most successful league that's happened. Uh, so I think we need to push it uh, further. Obviously, uh, it it is it is challenging because this, again, when it comes to organizing tournaments, you need funds and you need you know you need finances to come in, sponsors to come in, yeah. and uh, it, it has been a challenge. But I think uh, somehow we'll have to keep pushing it. Uh, and I feel that uh, you know, if, if the sports department uh, uh, in, in the government of India can come together and work with federation uh, to push at least one academy for uh, the football federation under, under 14 or under 16, mm. then I think it can be the start. I think also with the under, India is now going to host the under 17 women's world mm. cup. So that will be another hopefully an added push. Mm. Although I don't know if we have enough time to give these girls enough mm. sort of training and playing time to get to that level where they're competing with the, the rest of the world. But but given time, do you think it's a more achievable, when we talk about India's world cup go, dreams, mm. do you think it's a more realistic dream to, because I, I'm sure the way things are going, they'll expand the Women's World Cup from currently 24 to 32 teams. Mm. Just like they're expanding the men's from 32 to 48. Mm. So do you think it's a more realistic dream for India to reach the Women's World Cup finals? And do you think that will happen before the men's team gets there? I think realistically, yes, uh, women's team has got a better chance than men's team to really qualify for the World Cup. Uh, uh, not because of anything else, but I think uh, the men, men's football, the competition is, is, is very, very difficult because from Asia, you've got only three teams qualifying for the Asia Cup or, uh, sorry, for the World Cup. And you have almost 50, 50 plus countries playing it. And out of 56 or 60 countries in Asia, I think 80% of the countries that has football as their number one, number sport, one sport and the kind of investment uh, and time they give it to football is much is hundred times much more than India, mm. so it becomes very very challenging. Even if you don't need to look for anywhere far, you know you look at South Asia itself. If you're looking at your neighbor Nepal, number one sport is football. You look at uh, Bhutan, number one sport is football. You look at Maldives, uh, the number one sport is football. And um, you know it's, it's it's challenging. And then you go to a better countries like Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, where football is so big, uh, and then you know to compete in that level is going to be very very challenging so you'll have to really you know get get your structure your grassroots uh, as good as any any other top uh, you know asian countries like japan or south korea to produce that but whereas women i think those challenges are still still lesser um, you know you don't have entire gulf countries really participating in women's world cup or qualifiers whereas for men you have gulf countries that are like Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, Bahrain Saudi. Saudi. These guys are the highest spender of investors in, in, in football today. So the challenges are difficult. So yeah, I think that way if you look at it, I think women's football has definitely got more chance. But uh, I think we need to also put in double the effort what we've been doing right now. Finally, by uh, elections out of the way. <laughs> what next? Are we going to see you in a more uh, active football role again? Because it's 
No, football, I've always been uh, elections or not elections. I have my football, by Chumbatia football schools, which we've been doing very, very well, touch it uh, in the last 10 years. And today we are the biggest grassroots football program in India. Uh, I have a semi professional football club which has been there for the last 15, 20 years in Sikkim. Mm. Uh, we played I League. Uh, we've been state league champions for a number of times. Last two years we've been continuously state league champions. Uh, and we've been producing players from state as well. So that's always going to be there and that will continue. Uh, yes, apart from that, uh, obviously, we, l we feel that sometimes it's important for uh, a sports person who's really uh, done everything through hard work, sincere sincerity and uh, with uh, pure, uh, I think, dedication. Uh, to you know, uh, play the sport and achieve uh, whatever you achieve is through your pure, you know, sincerity, hard work, and dedication. And, and these are things that can be brought into politics in India because uh, today, the sad thing is, I, I don't, uh, uh, I won't say everyone, but uh, we need we need good politicians who are sincere to work for the betterment of the country. And uh, sadly, we don't see a lot of them with that interest as well. I think we need. Uh, people with good principle, honest and uh, sincerity is what we require. And uh, that is the sad part. And I think people in India, are, if you are not aware of it, uh, then you will always have the bad ones, um, you know, ruling, ruling and making policies for you. So we need uh, good politicians to come in. Uh, obviously, to say it's easy to really do it is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure I think uh, so with, with time, you will start getting good, honest, clean, sincere politicians who are going to do for, for the welfare of the people and for the country. Fair enough. With that, we'll wrap up this episode on that note. Thanks so much, Bhai, for taking the time. Thank you. Always great to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We'll be back again next week with another episode.